So I've noticed that, okay, so this is uh, Christopher Shaw, is that how you want to be called, or Chris? Uh, I go by Christopher, but the uh, okay. full, name, full name is Christopher Shaw and Shaw. Okay. Okay, Christopher. Um, you are a uh, director in a lot of Christian films, a lot of them short films. Um, what made you want to produce Christian film content? <laughs> wow. Well, it, it all started back in the womb. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so, so basically, I actually grew up wanting to be an actor. Um, I had stars in my eyes, and I was fascinated by movies, and I loved watching behind-the-scenes stuff. But I actually went to college for acting. I went to college at Otterbine in Westerville, Ohio, because I grew up in Ohio. And um, my major was a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Theater Performance. And uh, I moved to Southern California shortly after graduating and kind of lackadaisically pursued acting and film. I knew I could do it but I wasn't very motivated for some reason. I procrastinated quite a bit and just wasn't motivated. So um, long story short, um, I found myself over the years uh, more and more behind the camera. And I remember actually back in college, I had a, um, my parents had gotten me a, a VHS video recorder, if you remember the VHS days. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, I would play around with that, and I remember thinking, man, I really wish I could be in front of the camera and behind the camera at the exact same time, because I, I, at that point in time, I pretty much equally enjoyed both. Nowadays, however, I um, much more enjoy directing and creative producing, um, and I also enjoy editing as well. So it was a process. Um, you know, started out wanting to be a quote-unquote movie star, and then over the years, I, like I said, I found myself more and more behind the camera, and I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, so I want to do content that is at least redemptive um, and clean, uh, as opposed to all the worldly junk out there. So... And so... Um, I, and I don't do... I don't necessarily only work on just um, overtly faith-based stuff, you know, if it has a redemptive art, uh, a redemptive arc to it, I'm open to working on stuff like that. Um, if it's just, you know, really fun, clever, clean comedy, um, I'm connected to a lot of comedians, um, and uh, they're really, really funny, and they're Christian comics. So, um, and as a matter of fact, um, a lot of the short films and the um, hopefully soon to be released feature film I worked on was with uh, comedian Thor Ramsey, who is a pastor, an author, a screenplay writer, and an actor, of course, and a comedian. Very funny. He was the host of Bananas TV show that was on cable for a few years um, in over 90 million homes or something like that. If you uh, YouTube Thor Ramsey, you'll find a bunch of his comedy clips. Um, so a lot of my stuff has been with him, and uh, I've done some stuff with comedian Scott Wood as well, who also does impersonations, and he's a rapid-fire one-liner comedian. Really funny. So, so yeah, there's uh, that's pretty much how I... Okay, it's, it, it's interesting that you, meant, you bring up Thor Ramsey's name. Um, I noticed from your filmography, you seem to work with him a lot. How did that relationship start? Uh, Facebook. <laughs> um, I was, uh, well, actually, so I, I was going through a transition in my life um, in around, I think it was 2009, and um, I, was a, I was part of a, a ministry that went sour, I, and I moved out. Um, and I sort of moved out on my own, and um, and I around that time I had a subscription to ChristianCinema.com, and they have one of their offerings is they have something similar to what you can do through Netflix. You can uh, rent DVDs, or at least at that time you could. I don't know if they still do DVDs. I don't. They might not. But 
anyway, um, so I went to the comedy section of the DVDs because I felt like I needed to laugh. And I didn't really go in any particular order. It was just alphabetical order. And the comedy show that Thor Ramsey hosted was called Bananas. And so obviously that's very early in the alphabet. And so I was watching all these Bananas DVDs and I was watching the behind the scenes because Thor would do interviews with the comics that were featured and they do some, you know, just fun stuff around town and stuff. And so I was watching that and then I just sort of, you know, and I'm sitting there watching like, oh man, what would it be like to be friends with somebody like Thor Ramsey? You know, I, I was sort of fantasizing about like, having connections with people like this. They're they're really fun and funny and hilarious. In 2009, you know, that's kind of like around the time that Facebook was getting really big, and I just got this, I'm going to try to find these comics on Facebook. <laughs> and so I did. And so I connected with Thor, and I connected with John Brannion and Michael Jr., and all these different Christian comedians. And interestingly enough, they responded to my friend request, and we connected, and I would send them these, like, really goofy, I had a goldfish around that time, and I primarily got the goldfish to just do, I had some zany video ideas that was just basically me and the goldfish, or, or just the goldfish, and, you know, so I had this uh, kind of low-end camera, and I just shot these funny videos, and I would send them to people on Facebook, and be like, hey, check this out, or whatever, and that's kind of how I got connected with Thor, um, because he saw that I was a filmmaker, and um, very, very long story short, I ended up inviting him to participate in a film competition I was partaking in that we've done several times now together. It's called the 168 Film Project. It started out as a speed filmmaking competition where you have seven days to shoot, edit, um, and turn in a finished short film. And so in, in 20, for the 2010 168, I invited Thor to come on our team, and he graciously accepted. And that was the first time I met him in person was at one of our early production meetings before we even knew what we were going to shoot. And then we ended up doing this fun little film called Skip Listening, which is okay. about a nurse. Yeah, so. yeah, I watched that uh, after we first set up this interview. I watched uh, Skip Listening. Yeah, that was the yeah. first, first. That was... That was my very first professional looking film with like high end gear and like professionals who like do it for a living. And that was my very first collaboration with Thor Ramsey. And he had such a great time on it that uh, we've done several 168 film projects since. So, just for context purposes, just so you know, that film, we had about 10 or 11 days to write it. And then immediately following that, we had seven days, 168 hours to shoot, edit, turn in the finished product. And it ended up being runner-up best comedy, runner-up best comedy screenplay, and runner-up best film at the festival. So in total, that film took about 18 days, 17, 18 days? Yeah, if you include the writing and the casting and all that stuff. But, but the, the nuts and bolts of like actually filming it and editing it less than a week. Wow. Yeah. So we did so we've done that competition several times. I mean like I don't know, seven or eight times. So most of the short films you see on my YouTube channel or in my uh, director reel are from that competition. Now since those times the competition has branched out to involve more kinds of films. They have a screenwriting competition around October that's called the Rite of Passage, W-R-I-T-E of Passage. And so you can make Rite of Passage films that are part of that competition, um, and those are not speed films, meaning you don't you have longer than a week to work on them. And then they have unlimited documentaries, and then they have something now called the Alumni Entry, where if you are a veteran 168 producer, you can do an alumni entry, and basically as soon as you sign up, you can start working on it. Again, you don't have that one-week limit. And actually, our very first alumni entry was a mobster comedy last year called Wireless that Thor wrote. He didn't star in this one, but he wrote it, and I produced and directed and edited it. And uh, it was uh, 
it was Best Alumni Film, and our actress in it won Best Supporting Actress. And other than that, though, it had 12 nominations. And how many uh, films participate in this sort of event? It varies from year to year. Last year, there actually weren't that many. But um, I would highly encourage anybody listening or, or reading this to check out 168film.com. And they're not paying me to say that, but it's such a phenomenal opportunity. And honestly, looking at um, almost every project that I'm attached to right now, whether it's a short or a feature, somehow you can probably trace that project back to my start at working on 168 Film Projects. And that's a Christian so, organization? Yeah, it's a faith-based um, uh, filmmaking competition. And... Uh, and just as a little side note, one of the things I love about it is, I don't know about you, but I know over the years I've had lots of ideas and like, oh, that'd be a funny short or that'd be a funny movie. But when you participate in a competition like that, whether it's the 168 or 48 hour film festival, which is not faith based, but still, there's all kinds of different film competitions that have time limits. And with the time limit, it forces you to finish the film. It's, it's a make or break. You're either going to finish it or you're not. Can't afford to be a so, perfectionist. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and actually, yeah, you can be, unfortunately, you can be too much of a perfectionist that it, you know, you end up procrastinating and it hinders the release of your product. If we hadn't done a 168, we probably never would have done Skip Listening or any of the several that followed that. So, phenomenal opportunity. And then backtracking a little bit back to Skip Listening, one of the reasons that Thor came on our team was because he had this script, and at the time the movie was called Youth Group, and he thought, well, if I'm ever going to get this movie made, I should probably network with some filmmakers. And so one of the reasons he came on our team was so he could network with filmmakers to get his feature made. And so very long story short, uh, later that year we did a proof of concept trailer for that feature, and again at the time it was still called Youth Group. And then a couple years later, a name actor came on board. And then a couple years later, that name actor was instrumental in landing funding for the feature film, which was around 1.5 or so million dollars for the feature. And again, very long story short, middle of 2016, we're shooting the feature that we shot the proof of concept for in 2010. So um, if you have an idea, and you have the means to do a really good pitch video for it, like a proof of concept trailer, or some people call it a mock trailer. I highly recommend doing something like that because it's a visual representation of your vision for the project as opposed to just black and white words on a page. So the film was shot in full length in 2016? Yes, it was shot in 2016. It's not released yet, um, but the last I heard, there is a possible, uh, it could possibly be released later this year. Okay. We don't know. We don't know for sure yet. But and if you go to I am the movie is now called Church People. That if I saw. To, if you go to imdb.com and search Church People, you can see the casting crew there. Um, there's no there's no official poster or anything like that yet. Um, we, you know, all that stuff's got to be marketed and strategized properly, so it's not ready to release yet. So, Church People, which was originally named Youth People, right? Group. Um, has been a project since at least 2010? Yeah, and, and, and in Thor's hands, it was a project probably at least a year or two before that. And and just FYI, the, the average number of years I've heard that it takes movies that actually make it to the screen, the average number of years is nine years from script to screen. So we're kind of right on track because we're about nine years into this thing as far as you know, trying to get it out there. Interesting. I didn't know that about movies. Yeah, it takes a, it can take a long time. Well, especially when you don't if you don't have funding, like if you don't have somebody who just goes, Here's money, go make a movie, right? Then you have to get the funding. And if you don't have a distributor, which we didn't when we shot it, and um and I'm still not sure whether or not we're going to self-distribute or have an actual official distributor. It sounds like we may be self-distributing at this point. But my point is, is if you don't have the financing to start and you don't have a distributor on board, 
then you have to land both of those things. So on the front end, you got to get the financing, and then if you don't have a distributor when you shoot it, you got to then put the movie together. So there's the editing time and the mixing time and all that stuff, and then you got to find a distributor who, you know, lets your movie and wants to get it out there. So or you self-distribute. So, um, so it's it's a very it can be a very long process. And, and those two bookends of the, of the process, the financing and the distribution, can take quite a while. They can take years. As a matter of fact, uh, there was another movie that one of the people who were one of the writers on our project had another movie that he had uh, written uh, that I believe he was the sole writer on that film. But he had another movie in production at around the same time, or actually at the same time as ours was filming. And it's not out yet either. And not only that, but um, one of our actors in the film, who's also a producer on the film, Stephen Baldwin, he just had a movie come out um, this month called The Least of These. It's the Graham Stain story, who was a martyred missionary to India. He was an Australian missionary to India, and he was martyred. That movie just came out this month, and they shot that film before we shot ours. Wow. So that's you know that's like three or four years after they shot the film that it's finally in theaters. So it it can take a while. So what are the ways that these challenges can be overcome? Well, uh, like I said, I think one of the um, one of the the biggest uh, benefits to doing what we did with the proof of concept trailer was that you can visually get the representation of what your film could like if it had the proper backing. So basically what Thor did was he took his script and he pulled scenes from the script that he thought would make a good trailer and we shot those scenes. And then we put it into this proof of concept trailer. You know, we hired actors. The actors weren't guaranteed. Well, actually, technically the actors volunteered. But the actors weren't guaranteed to be in the actual feature film. But obviously, there was that possibility. And as it turns out, two of the actors in our concept picture trailer ended up in the, the fully financed feature. And that was the, the guy who plays the senior pastor and Thor Ramsey, who plays the lead. So, so anyway, my point is overcoming the, the incredible odds against you and getting a movie not only made but also out there is whatever you can do to showcase what your work looks like, um, ethically, of course, uh, then do that. I mean, get your work in front of people. Uh, that's why it's important to have a reel and, and stuff like that. Because honestly, if you know, if you were an actor and you wanted to act in one of my movies, I wouldn't be like, oh, well, show me your resume. No, I want to see your reel. I want to see what you look like on camera. I want to see. I want to see the actual results of your work. I, I, I can barely care less whether or not you've worked with, you know, Scorsese or whomever. You know, <laughs> if you can't act, you can't act, or or you need to take some classes or whatever. So, so I want to see what you look like on camera, and I want to see your work. If you're a cinematographer, and you want to come on a film, well. I want to see what your cinematography looks like. So show me some examples. Show me your reel. Show me a short that you've done. Show me your examples. So that's why I think a visual representation of either what your movie could look like or what your acting work looks like or what your cinematography looks like or what your sound work looks like. If you have an actual example, then that gives the person you're pitching to a much clearer idea, idea than words on a page. Makes sense. Um, yeah, just, you know, share the product, get the product in front of people and see what they think. And, you know, that's the best way to get good feedback, I feel. And of course, that's not a slam dunk guarantee, you know. You're not, just because you make a proof of concept trailer doesn't mean you're going to, you know, actually get the film made. But I think it really gives you um, several steps ahead of the game because most people just have things like a treatment, a log line, a script, and they're pitching that, but no visual representation. So I, I just, because of the, the powerful quality that video can bring to enhance a project and to enhance the vision of something, 
I mean, you know, just look at commercials that are really brilliantly well done. You know, funny commercials, serious commercials, if they're really hard hitting or funny, they, they make an impact and you remember them. So, and that's what happened with this. We did this proof of concept trailer and I started blasting it all over social, social media. I mean, I was blasting it on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and, and just, and people loved it, but I was waiting for the people who loved it who could actually help get it made. And then a name actor eventually saw it, came on board to help produce and to find the funding, and, and it happened. It took a while, and it was a ride, but it happened. Was there a major backer that stands out to you? Uh, well, yeah. There's actually, the, the person who financed the film was, was one person. Um, it wasn't necessarily the original plan that we're going to have multiple backers, but the person who ended up financing the film was one person, and it was a really good friend of uh, one of the actors in the film. So, so I mean, there were there were years of meetings with like, here's this wealthy person in, you know, who has a TV station, and here's this wealthy person who does this, that, or the other, and all those meetings sort of kind of went nowhere. And then all along, there's this really good friend who's wealthy of this uh, of our of one of our actors, and they ended up basically on the money side of things producing the film together, and that was uh, Stephen Baldwin and Mike Lindell. I was going to mention Michael Lindell because yeah. I wrote an article back in November about how he became a he's he's becoming this major faith film uh, faith based film backer. So it, it's just funny that you, you mentioned his name, and I was going to direct you at directly ask if he was a, a backer of the film. So that, that was pretty that was a pretty full circle for me to hear that. Who's our sole financier? And then uh, there's a film coming out that looks really good in um, March March 29th called Unplanned, and he was one of the backers on that. He yeah. He was a full backer, but he was one of the significant backers on that. Yes, that that's what the uh, article I wrote was about, was that he backed that, and, you know, he, he, he makes my pillow, which if you listen to the radio, you know what my pillow is. Um, but, you know, him, he's funding movies. It's just random it, that, you know, yeah. you, you described that all these, like, movie connections weren't really working out, but the guy who makes my pillow... <laughs> Yep. Ends up. Yeah, exactly. And it, and he was good friends with Stephen Baldwin, so that's kind of how that came about. Um, so, and uh, Mike Lindell has a cameo in Church People, and he also has a cameo in Unplanned. That I heard. Like, he has a yep. cameo in that movie. Yep. So, one of the things I've noticed uh, early on is the absence of a lot of Christian comedy in, among full length movies. Um, at least mainstream ones. Why yeah. do you think that is? I think there's multiple reasons. Um, uh, the two that come to mind are um, typically. Now, now, please hear me when I say this. We've come a long way, but typically, faith-based films are not well produced or well written. Um, so, I would say the majority, whether they're comedy or not, tend to kind of stink. They're not that good uh, from a from a from a professional perspective, you know. And quite frankly, faith-based films get laughed at a lot for the wrong reasons because they just don't match the quality of secular films. From a, again, from a technical craft standpoint. And please forgive the background noises, but my family came back, and my dog's here, and my daughter's <laughs> here, so um, we'll, we'll try to forge through. But um, so anyway, um, so there's that reason that the quality kind of isn't there, I would say, most of the time. However, that gap between, you know, that gap is, is narrowing, and I think they're getting better and better. Um, and then the other thing is, is... Um, Christian comedy is kind of a funny thing. I mean, there's there's Christians out there who don't even know that such a thing as Christian comedy exists, which I find rather amazing, uh, because God created laughter, yeah. <laughs> you know, 
and uh, and the, there's all kinds of Bible references to joy. Now, granted, happiness and joy are two different things, and laughter and joy, you know, don't necessarily mean the same thing either. But there's all kinds of Bible references to joy, uh, life abundantly, which has different connotations as well, of course. And um, I believe it's even scripture, if I'm not mistaken, that says that um, laughter is good medicine for the soul. So it's it, it's it's perplexing and disheartening. Um, and quite frankly, my journey into comedy filmmaking, which I don't I don't solely do comedy filmmaking, but I tend to gravitate towards that, especially with my connections with Thor and other comedians, Scott Wood. And others, but um, uh, I tend to gravitate towards comedy. But my journey there, I believe the Lord was working on my heart in the process of me getting there. Because around that time that I said I felt like I needed to laugh, and I was renting those DVDs from ChristianCinema.com, <laughs> I really I felt the Lord. I believe the Lord was working on my heart, and and because like my very very first one six eight film project. I'm a quirky guy, so it has my quirks in it. But I used to think that, like, man, if I'm going to do a film and if I'm going to do a faith-based film, I have to be, it has to be meaty and it has to be hard-hitting and it has to, you know, all these has to, it has to do this and that and the other thing, which is, quite frankly, I think where a lot of faith-based films go wrong because there's too many checklists to check off. And it's like, make a good movie with a good message, you know? It, it all has to blend, it all has to balance. Right. But anyway, um, I really felt the Lord working on my heart around that time, and I just I felt like I needed to laugh. And wouldn't you know it, I, that was happening, and I was coming out of my funk, and um, it, 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 you know, and I met Thor, and we started working on stuff like Skip Listening and other fun shorts and, and the feature, and here we are. Huh. So, do you see that? Do you see the? Do you see there being more uh, Christian movies, specifically in the comedy area? Do you see that increasing in the future? I do, especially if more of them are well written and produced. See, there's 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 uh, there's two major facets to any movie, Christian or not, comedy or not. And that is the story in the script, and then the execution of the visual and the sound. If you have all that there, then it, you know it can be a really good film. So um, I believe that when those things are there, um, there's much more chance of more of those happening. And then, of course, there, it comes down to people attending the films. I mean, if you see the trailer for a film that you want to go see. If you want more films like that in the theater, then you need to support it at the box office. Or if it goes straight to DVD or whatever, then you need to support it on people. You know, the, the people who finance these films have to see there's a market for it because it is a business too. Right. You know what I mean? They want to make their money back. You know? Um, they want to just throw a million dollars away or $500,000 away or $5 million away. They want to see a return on that investment. So if you make a good film and the audience shows up, so I would encourage you who are listening or reading this that you know if you see the trailer for Church People or Unplanned or other faith-based films and you go, yeah, that looks good. I want to go see that. Go see it on opening weekend because that tells the box office and that tells you know quote unquote Hollywood and financiers and so on and so forth, that tells people there is a market for those films. I mean, look what happened with The Passion of the Christ. How many years ago was that now? Like, oh, like 2000 years ago? Or something. <laughs> They're doing a sequel, by the way. Did you know that? I th thought I heard about that, but... <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they're filming yet. They could be, but I know there's a script, and Jim Caviezel's attached, but they are doing a sequel. I think it's called The Resurrection. Huh. Or, or something, uh, and Mel Gibson's directing, and so, but my point is, is look what happened with that film, you know, like, huge box office results, and it did open the gate quite a bit for more 
financing for other faith-based content. And pretty much since that time, you know, you got people like the Kendrick Brothers knocking out of the park at the box office, the Irwin Brothers. I mean, I can only imagine a $7 million film, like 80 or so million dollars at the box office. Yeah, it's huge. huge. And huge. what I've noticed is that there's a lot of faith-based films that have really good returns on investment. Um, the one of the films made recently, I can only imagine that you know that that performed really well at the box office despite being rel very low budget and you know and, and I believe that came out on a weekend where other movies that were much higher budget failed or flopped. So yeah, I, I don't remember what exactly came out that weekend other than that one. However, three three weeks <laughs> three weeks in a row there was a faith-based film release. There was I Can Only Imagine first. I believe the second one was Paul Apostle of Christ. And the third one was God's Not Dead, A Light in the Darkness, the third God's Not Dead movie. Back... They, they made a third one? After week. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I saw it on Netflix recently. Very, very good. I was very impressed. I, I really liked the first one of that movie. Like, that was a really... You know, that really stood out. Way better. This one is way better. Way better. Deeper. Yes. Way better. It's deeper. Um, if I'm not mistaken, first time director of a feature. Um, and you've got John Corbett in it, who is great in the role that he plays. I mean, it's really well done. I was very, very impressed. Well. Compared to the first one, way better. So God's Not way, Dead way 3 is a must see? I, I think so, personally. Yeah. Yep. I think it was very well done. Yeah, I really like God's Down Dead One. Um, it got me kind of like seeing the uh, the future of Christian films. So yeah, God's Not Dead Three. I'll put that on my must watch list. <laughs> and and FYI, but but I think that's but I think that's encouraging. Here's the bottom line: if it's a well written story and script, that well, if it's a good story and a well written script, and it's Executed professionally, it looks like. In other words, it looks like a real movie, right? Then you have the strong potential of more movies like that getting made. And if people, and again, if people show up at the box office, I mean, the opening weekend is huge as to how long it stays at the box office and whether or not things like that get financed again. And quite frankly, when it comes to church people, there has been talk of a sequel. Wow. I'm a little doubtful that will happen if the box office results aren't that good, though. So That would make sense. Go see it on the opening weekend whenever it comes. I don't know when it's coming out, but hopefully later in 2019. Um, go see it opening weekend because that makes a huge difference as to how long it stays at the theaters and it can also make a huge difference as to whether or not more faith-based comedies or a sequel to that one or whatever gets made. So unpacking church people a little more, I noticed the sort of like office level cringiness if you've ever seen The Office, and I mean that as a compliment. Um, is there a particular influence, like whether it be a work or a specific comedian that uh, kind of has like, that you can kind of see in the film? Yeah, I mean, it it, it, it came through the brain of uh, Thor Ramsey, and he's a he's a very interesting uh, comedian. And I mean that in a good way. He's, of course, I, every I comedian his, is. I, I, it's very funny. Um, I find his scripts, uh, I, I love his screenwriting, personally, um, and, and I enjoy working with him. Uh, we're kind of like brothers, in a way. You know, we have our headbutt moments and stuff like that, but um, but but it's a fun collaboration, I think overall. So, um, but yeah, I would say he was he was uh, incredibly influential in the vision of the project. And as far as you know, inspiration and stuff, that's a better question for him to answer. But basically, the gist of it is is Thor Ramsey plays a character that is a youth pastor. He's a very popular. Uh, he's basically a celebrity youth pastor, 
and he finds himself caught up in the branding, marketing machine of the megachurch that he's a part of, and he's being overseen by a senior pastor, as you see in the proof of concept trailer, who's kind of over the top, zany, and he's all about the show. He's all about getting the butts in the seats. You know, more souls in the seats, more people get to hear the gospel. But he sort of, you know, skips over the gospel part and, and goes for the show. So he always feels like he has to top himself from his, his last thing and so on and so forth. Which leads to the and, crucifixion. <laughs> right, which leads to the concept of he wants to actually, you know, crucify somebody. Um, and, and, and for people who might get, like, uh, the ruffles feathered about that. Hold up. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, uh, can you say that again? It kind of cut out. Don't assume too much. Watch the film and see the redemptive arc that takes place. Okay. I, that happens, you know, at the end of the film. So but, uh, I, I also had another question because I definitely was going to ask about the whole uh, church, mega church, uh, just because that was one of the readily apparent details was that, you know, this was a large church, uh, very uh, focused on the marketing side of things. You know, how do you kind of, a lot of Christians would be turned off by the fact that this doesn't seem like a real church. Um, is that something that well, needs to be well, proven? Actually, or is that just kind of the point that, you know, maybe these churches focus way too much on uh marketing the marketing aspect right it, it's very much um uh, well first of all let me say this i think this is important to know church people is a romantic comedy satire so it's uh, it's it's important to understand that that's the genre of the film but even said being a satire it's still a redemptive story like there is redemption at the end but in order to see the redemption, you got to kind of see the stuff that happens leading up to the redemption, right? You know, we don't we are saved from our sin as, as already clean people. We're dirty and we're filthy and we have issues, and and we need to be saved from ourselves, right? Right. So this movie this movie highlights that, um, but in the context of a mega church culture that has gone above and beyond the call of preaching the gospel, and again, it's more about the show. The senior pastor's like, how can I talk what I did before? How can I be bigger and better and get more souls in the seats, you know? And that becomes the focus about the show as opposed to preaching the gospel, and Thor's character is the youth pastor who's caught up in that branding, marketing machine, and he feels like it's eating him up, and he doesn't know how to get out, because he just wants to go back to the way it was, when he was just preaching the gospel. And it wasn't all about the show. And so that's what that story is about, and you see the character arc of the senior pastor in that process of the movie. And a bunch of others in this. We have Joey Fatone playing the worship leader. Uh, Donald Faison plays uh, Thor's character's uh, business manager, you know, for his books and stuff. And so there's there's a lot of fun and zaniness throughout. But again, overall, there is a redemptive arc, and um, it's uh, it's kind of a wake up call in a way, but with humor. I mean, if you can imagine this, this is not available to the public on um, on YouTube, uh, but you can get the DVD. Thor and I, um, not too long after we collaborated on Skip Listening, Thor and I worked on a project that Gary Emmerich, with Gary Emmerich Productions, wrote, and then Thor punched up the script to make it even funnier. But we did a project that's a short called One Night Stand, and it's a comedy that tackles the sobering sin of adultery, if you can imagine that. <laughs> There's different ways. That, see, here's the thing, and I, I'm reminded of comedian Michael Jr., who says this, and he's certainly not the only one who says this, but, you know, comedy does something to help people receive uh, be, because um, it breaks down walls. If you're laughing, it's breaking down some walls. And if you have, a, if you have an important message, especially if you have, you know, an important 
uh, gospel-centered type message, then if walls are broken down, people are more inclined to receive it. And so comedy can be a very effective tool. Not only is laughter great medicine, but it also helps tear down people's walls so that they can receive the truth of God's Word. So it's possible that church people gets released this year. Um, is there anything... It's possible. That, it's it's possible. not official, but it's possible. Is there anything, any other project that you're working on? Or just yeah. getting ready yeah, to work actually, on? Yeah, I'm actually attached to several projects, both features and shorts, that all need funding. So, uh, let's see. I work with another writer in Michigan. Her name is Jamie A. Hope. And uh, she has a heart for millennials who are leaving the church in droves because they're attracted by the perceived power they see in the occult. And so a lot of what she writes is stuff that peels back the curtain into the spiritual realm. So she writes more supernatural, suspense thriller type stuff um, that uh, is viewed through a biblical lens. And uh, she actually has a book on Amazon called Illusion. It's the first of a three-book series. The other ones aren't written yet, but she has the first one out um, called Illusion. You can see it on Amazon. But uh, we're hoping to adapt that into a screenplay and make that feature. But that one's going to be a big budget because uh, there's a lot of CGI and stunts involved in that one, and that's not a you know that's not like a 20 day shoot like Church People was. That's probably going to be more like a 30 35 day shoot because there's just so much involved and there's so many you know safety precautions and stuff like that with the stunts and, and all that. Um, and then she has another one that's similar uh, genre, but lower budget. That's probably around a, a million dollar budget or so that uh, we're hoping to get done. And uh, the filmmaker actor Will Wallace has come on board to uh, uh, help in a producer fashion. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, there's several. And then actually um, on the short end of the spectrum, uh, Jamie wrote a story that honors veterans, so it's a drama, and it's basically about the struggles that veterans go through post-deployment, and we're hoping to shoot that one in Michigan, and I think we're ramping up the fundraise for that one. It's a short, but it's got a it's got a pretty hefty budget um, because of, you know, we wanted to do, to do a service, we wanted to do a really good job, and, you know, there's a lot of people in Aston Crew to pay, you right. know. Um, people do this for a living. So, um, and then uh, the the monster comedy I told you about, which was a short that won Best Alumni Film at last year's One Six Eight Festival. Uh, Thor actually wrote a sequel to that, so we're hoping to raise money um, to do that one this year. Uh, uh, we need to up because uh, we don't have a budget for that one yet. And uh, and so yeah, there's there's gods. I, I work with another producer, writer, actress. Her name is Susan Shearer. Um, she actually helped us produce Wireless, the monster comedy. And uh, we have a we have our own supernatural like sort of it's a drama. It's a heavy drama, but with a thriller twinge. Um, familiar spirits, and it's about a distraught widowed mother who recently loses her daughter as well and then she thinks she's being communicated with by her her the ghost of her daughter and it turns out it's a it's a deceiving familiar spirit and so it's a short film um so yeah, there's 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 gods so yeah that's definitely a nice uh collection of projects that really go beyond just comedy um, you got like some thriller, uh, you know, like you said, supernatural. That's uh, just, yep. and then you know, shorts and features. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's just good to hear. Um, oh, oh, and, and uh, sorry, I forgot to say this. Thor actually wrote a feature-length version of Skip the Thing as well. So we're hoping to get that out there. Get that made. That's probably in the ballpark of a million dollar budget as well. I, I do want to mention one more thing too. Um, 
in the context of funding and, and something that, that has the strong potential of working, there's also this idea that I have that I think could really work, and that is if, if church fellowships who support the arts and Christians in the arts and they want to see more content made, we can actually produce a live comedy fundraiser show. I call it the Night of Comedy and Short Films Fundraiser, NCSFF. And there's a website, ncsff.com. Uh, that's N as in Nancy, ncsff.com. Um, and basically the, the gist of that is it's Christian short films. Um, it's like it's a 90-minute show that unifies the church with after and the to help. What's that? I didn't catch the so, URL. Uh, N is in Nancy, C is in comedy, S F F as in Frank Frank dot com. Okay, I got that that time. So that's a ninety minute show you said, and they do that in multiple locations around the country, or is it more regional? Or is it like an online thing? No, we can do it anywhere that is sponsored. It costs about $5,500 to produce. So whether it's Christian business owners who want to sponsor in exchange for advertising leading up to and at the event, or if that we can bring it to pretty much anywhere the anywhere they can sponsor it. So, um, so yeah. Um, and what it does is it helps support more faith-based film content without having to wait the traditional length of time it takes to land an investor and so on and so forth. It has a lot of built-in facets into it, including uh, built-in accountability, because ideally the, the gist of it is we go to a place, we raise money for either short or development funds for a feature or, or even a feature if there's enough risk. And then we we go to another place and do the same thing, but then hopefully the following year that we're at that place, we come back and show the money we raised the first time and do it all over again for either the same project or another project depending on what's in the queue. So a lot of these things because a lot of these reports, for example, through comedy shows. Oh, okay. You know, so. so I think I'm almost out of questions. Um, anything else you would like to add? Uh, the other thing is just that if you're if you're uh, listening and you're or reading this and you're a filmmaker or an actor or whatever, uh, we a DNA where you don't have to wait for to ring to work. There's so many resources that are available to you in just about every has a smartphone and there's pretty decent quality video on a smartphone so if you're an actor and you need to get your work out there and you're not getting cast in anything shoot something on your smartphone same if you're a filmmaker or a cinematographer or whatever practice 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 with what you have available basically what I did I mean if you want to look at at significantly ramping up to my professional career. Well, if you look at if you look at up to the to the what I would consider the start of my professional career, I started with low end stuff. I had a low end digital camera, and I had a goldfish, and I just made content with. And I eventually met Thor, and. I did collaborations, and the more you network, and the, so here's the deal. If you want to do a short film, unless God tells you otherwise, you don't have to wait, right? You might, you might not have a camera, but you might know somebody with a camera. You might not have a, a boom mic, but you might know somebody with a boom mic. Or you can go on Facebook groups for filmmakers and ask, hey, anybody want to make a film this weekend, you know? My, my point in saying all this is there's all kinds of resources at our disposal that were not available 20 years ago. Right. And there's all kinds of ways to get your work out that weren't available 20 years ago.
So, again, unless God tells you otherwise, just do it. Go make stuff. And you can build your own reel or you can, you know, get somebody to help you. I mean, it's one of the services I offer. I, offer, I, I do editing, too, so I can edit together reels. Um, I can... Um, I can produce a proof of concept trailer for you, bring the crew together and all that stuff. Obviously, there needs to be a budget, <laughs> but, you know, because uh, I'm not going to get people to do it for free, and I'm not going to do it for free. But, um, but you know what I'm saying? There, there's so many resources available, whereas, you know, early in, in, in filmdom, you know, you had to use real film, and that was extremely expensive, and not only did you have to have the actual film running through a camera that was a, you know, ridiculously expensive camera, but then you had to develop the film. You don't have all that rigmarole now, you know? Like I said, you can whip out your smartphone and shoot a video with that in decent quality. There, there are actually feature films that have been made and distributed that were shot on smartphones. So huh. there's, there's very limited ex excuses now as to you know, why your stuff isn't out there. Maybe Steven Spielberg hasn't called yet, but you can't have work displayed on your Facebook page, displayed on LinkedIn, displayed on Twitter. You can get your work out there. Blasted it all over the internet, and eventually Stephen Baldwin saw it, and he was like, that's, that's funny. I want to do something like that. And, you know, the snowball world. Well, that's a pretty powerful message. You know, just go start Very making nice contact. Start, start making content. Go make stuff. That's a really good message for any uh, people wanting to be in the content producing industry. Um, I think I'm out of questions. Um, this was a very nice interview. Um, a lot of good material. And I definitely look forward to seeing church people when it comes out. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And thank you for your time. And I know I rambled a lot, but so I hope you don't have to do harder on the that. <laughs> yeah, it, the, the work begins, I, I suppose. <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah. Um, well, well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. God bless you. God bless you. All right.